the one of the preferred vendors with Power Partners with my home group. I'm also the Power Partners Spotlight of the week. Super exciting. Um, but you guys have a branded home warranty package. It's the My Home Warranty. So if you haven't seen it, check it out. There's brochures right there. They're also on the plexiglass thing over there. Um, but yeah, we were chit-chatting before the class about home warranty coverage, air conditioning coverage, right. pre-listing coverage. So let me ask you some questions. Okay, how many people out here get, because uh, we're talking about doing comps and getting a listing, right? That's what we're doing today. So how many people here do a pre-inspection of a home before you put it on the market? Show of hands. Okay, a couple people. All right. Now, you mean by a licensed professional? Right. It's important. Uh, one guard will do that. They will do. Tell, tell us a little bit about the uh, coverage for a listing coverage and, okay. and how that works. And then I'm going to jump in after you finish that and say some stuff about it. Okay. Perfect. From my perspective. Go ahead. So we have two plans we have seller's coverage. And seller's coverage is available to your sellers while it's listed on the market. And in essence, it's free. For the entire time it's on the market it's a great benefit as you're doing your listing presentations as you're going out trying to get these listings you need to differentiate yourself differentiate yourself and um provide some extra value so saying when you list with me you're going to get a warranty during the listing period um, is a great thing to do we have taken a step further and we took the concept of a certified pre-owned vehicle let's call it a certified lexus and we applied it to residential homes so when you take the listing, we go out and we do a mechanical inspection. We look at all of the mechanical components of the home. So we're not looking at roof, we're not looking at foundation, and we're not gonna look at the um, overall structure of the home, but we're looking at everything from air conditioning, water heater, pool equipment, um, the appliances, all of those items in that house. And we're giving it a, yes, it works, this needs some repair. What is the benefit of that? There's a lot of benefits to it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Number one, the number one benefit, okay, because your clients are going to say, well, why should I spend this money? Then I have to disclose stuff, and then I have to do this, and I have to do that. Okay. There's the number one benefit is that it gives your seller leverage. Leverage when that house eventually gets inspected by somebody else, mm -hmm. right? Because what happens when that house gets inspected by somebody else? You're gonna get a 38 page report, right? All the windows need to be replaced, right? The roof is nearing the end of its life, the air conditioner's in there, it's like, guess what? You got now a report that says, oh, wait a second, no. So it gives you leverage, that's number one. Number two, it's gonna take away a lot of the unknowns that a buyer has when they're looking at your listing, right? By that I mean, they're coming in, they're seeing how pretty the house is, they love the house and all this kind of stuff, they get all excited about the house, but then what happens? They go home, they sleep on it, and the next day they're like, Ooh, this is a 25 year old house what about all the expenses we're going to have right go ahead i'm sorry it, no it's true exactly i get call after call after call especially during the summer shelly we're going to put a contract on this but it has the original air conditioning what does that mean what does that mean for my buyers you know or from a seller standpoint we want to make sure we offer home warranties because this has the original air conditioning unit there is a air conditioning mandate that is going on right now with our 22 units. Those are anything 2008, 2009 or older. Um, at the end of the year, they're stopped producing the refrigerant that goes into it. I'm actually gonna do a class on it. Is there like a big black market on the other Freon now? No. Okay. Um, a lot of people are like, it's, I mean, I get these calls like, it's gonna be the end of the world. And I'm like, right. it's really not. Right. But, from a cost standpoint, it is going to be an added expense that buyers are gonna to have to kind of be aware of. But there's ways as a listing agent that you can still market those older air conditioning systems. And there's ways on a buyer's agent, that side, 
but you can still negotiate in the contract where you can still give your buyers that warm and fuzzy feeling. How do they do that? Um, on a buyer side, I always recommend a two-year warranty. Mm -hmm. Build it into the contract as a negotiating tool. You know what, this has an older air conditioning unit. We wanna make sure that our clients are protected. We want more than one year in the warranty. That's gonna be a little easier to sell than we want a brand new air conditioning unit, even right. though that unit's still working fine. Um, on a listing agent side, you do something like the certified pre-owned home. They walk into that house, that house they know is dated, but there's a certificate that says this house is certified. The air conditioning is certified, the water heater is certified, the pool equipment is certified. All of these appliances you're looking at are certified and they're covered. It's going to give them that warm and fuzzy feeling. It will. And it's going to take away when they leave the house and they're and they're having those that night where they're two are talking together, trying to decide we really want to do this or, or not. When they see that, it's just going to take one of those unknowns off the plate. <coughs> so it's going to be great for your listing. Also, it's going to be great for your buyer if you listen to Shelley and you get a two-year warranty on one of those older homes. You say, hey, why don't we see if we can get an extra year warranty on the air conditioner? That will give you time, right, to save the money because we know that this air conditioning unit is going to have to be replaced in the next five years, right? Now, let me ask you a question. Uh, most home warranty companies out there, I don't know if you guys are aware of this, and you got to be careful for liability of yourself. Don't go to your client and say, oh yeah, you know, we'll put a home warranty on it, and if the air conditioner can't get fixed, ah, they'll replace it. You guys do that? Some people do that? Don't do that. Because most home warranty companies do not do a air conditioning replacement. They give you a per diem kind of buyout. Okay, what about one guard? We will do a replacement. If we can't fix it, we replace it. So at, replacement. So at our um, with our contract, we will cover parts. We we'll cover labor. We cover so we cover the whole unit. We cover labor. We cover the refrigerant. We cover everything. The part that's the responsibility of the homeowner would be any construction costs that go into putting the new unit where the old unit was. Which is standard. So Which if they got to cut into the ceiling, they got to cut into a wall, they got to do whatever. Mm -hmm. That's going to be the responsibility of that person but they'll replace the unit. So you guys have to make sure that you're clarifying that with your clients so that you don't get sued later on, right? Okay. Yeah. So I am a big one for be the source of the source, not the source. So mm -hmm. letting somebody like me be the source. Um, I, right. I've talked to homeowners all the time. I think I'm one of the few reps that actually will call homeowners and talk to them. Um, I also have a team of people that I trust to call um, homeowners and talk to them, going over what is a warranty, how does it work, what does air conditioning coverage look like. As a homeowner, what is your responsibility as far as it does come with an air conditioning, you know, changing your air filters, that kind of thing. Um, because it is important. And I am probably the most brutally honest home warranty rep out there. Transparent. I'm transparent. I always say that. I'm transparent. I love that word. Yeah. That's I'm, a, I'm an be. educator by profession, <laughs> so I'm all about educating everybody how it works, what do you, what can you expect, um, because just like you don't want that call in the middle of the summer, my air conditioning doesn't work, and I have six dogs and four kids, and we're stuck, I don't want that call from you either, and I don't get those calls. So, um, my system works. Tell me again right. listing coverage. So okay. the listing coverage, we have the exact same coverage that your buyers would get. So we don't have limits on air conditioning, appliances, anything like that. You put it on, as soon as you take the listing, you call me, email me, my office, whatever, we'll put it on. It starts from that point, goes forward. <coughs> anything that is, when you do that certified plan, anything that is found not in good working order, so if we go out there. And the certified plan is pretty straightforward. I right. That. For regular listing coverage. The regular coverage. listing coverage, the whole concept of pre existing conditions yes. raises its ugly head. Yes. You get it, we don't know about it. Oh, guess what? The, the uh, garbage bowl is on work. Oh, so, okay, when did it stop working exactly? The way, how do you handle that? The way we look at regular. So he's asking about regular seller's coverage that doesn't have a mechanical inspection, which we have that option as well. Um, what happens then if there's no mechanical, mechanical inspection, we don't know what's pre-existing and what just happened. So what will happen is if something happens, we will call one of our contractors, we'll send them out for service, if they can, without a doubt, tell us that it was pre-existing. 
So that means there are, um, if it's a water heater and there's all of this rust and stuff coming off of it, you can tell the leak has been happening for a long time, we're not gonna cover it. Um, if it's an air conditioning unit where the filters are completely dirty, the coil's completely dirty, that kind of thing, and you called it in a week after you put coverage on it, we're not gonna cover it, um, that kind of stuff. But if, but the contractor has to be able to tell us without a doubt that it was pre-existing, and they usually take pictures and send them to us that shows the proof. Now, That's just to clarify, happens. we're talking two separate things here. Yes. Okay, we're talking the difference between listing coverage, you know what listing coverage is, right? No. <laughs> That's when the, the buyer, the seller, will pay a lesser fee, maybe? It's the same. It's the same fee. Do they have to pay it right away, or do they pay it only if they have a call? They only pay it when it closes. Okay. So and let's say you have a home warranty. Like home warranty mm -hmm. Right. So let's say, let's say you buy a home warranty for your house at $650 a year, okay? What Shelly does <laughs> is they have listing coverage. So you can put it on the house, and you don't have to pay for it until close of escrow. Because what happens as soon as somebody puts their house on the market? Shit starts breaking, right? Water heater blows up, air conditioner quits working, all this kind of stuff. So you can offer that to your people. Okay, now then on top of that, to enhance that, enhance that, you can do a home inspection. Okay, where you do a mechanical inspection and all that kind of stuff so you can have the home certified. So that way you're protecting not only the seller of things that happen at the last second, which always happens as soon as you put them on the market, right? Because the house doesn't want them to leave. That's true. The house knows they're leaving and the house gets mad. And having leverage by having the home pre-certified for the listing, which is kind of more along the lines of what we're talking about today. Right. Okay. How much does it cost to have the pre-certification? The certification is fifty dollars. It doesn't matter if the house is fifty bucks, thousand square feet. Wait, really? Like, really? It's only fifty dollars. Only fifty. That's incredible. Are you kidding me? I had a so if you're you a, have to give you a shot and tell me that or just fifty bucks. And that's you have the inspection and the marketing materials. So I figured it was going to be two fifty. No, I thought it was more than that. It no, it's fifty. And we just did a house in North Scottsdale that was eleven thousand square feet. It was fifty dollars. What? what the? You do a condo, hell? it's fifty dollars. How do you guys do that without a business? Russ doesn't. Russ is the key man. Okay, so there is absolutely zero reason for any of you guys to not have your home pre-certified once you take the listing. Right. But absolutely zero reason. But I have two of them for you right now. I'm going to send you an email when we're done. I have one for you too. But here's the question, though, don't so there's no misunderstanding. It's fifty dollars to have it inspected. That the fifty dollars doesn't give you the pre-certification. If you choose to get the pre-certification, oh. how much is that? Wait a second. Well, you is have there to, a hitch? Well, you do the seller's coverage, and then that the so you have to have the seller's oh. coverage. Now she's I like. Understand. And the bottom line is just so <laughs> unclear. Well, I guess I technically you could order a seller's coverage. How much does it cost? No, get, let me finish. I got this. So the 50 bucks up front, I can do that as a service to my client. Yes. And say, look, let's make certain, okay, that these, uh, uh, so that you're covered here. Uh, let's really encourage the buyer to make sure they know that we've already purchased this for them. Make sure it's in the listing and a little sign and everybody's happy, right? And they pay the six fifty, and life it's, they live happily ever after. Yes. But let's say you're doing a deal with, you know, someone who's maybe not as talented as as, as the folks no, in this room. Exactly. And so, and that person says, "Bull, hunky, we're going to use X Y Z home warranty company." Okay. So that means that you don't give that service to the buyer. You don't have to pay for it. You don't have to pay for it as long as your clients didn't use the word. Right, but then let's say there's a seller issue and they say, wow, my uh, uh, AC went out or my garbage disposal broke or the dishwasher broke and you came out and fixed it and provided value and service for that under the seller's coverage aspect, you're still gonna have to pay at close of escrow 650 bucks. No, right. no, you pay the cost of the claim or the cost of the plan, whichever is less expensive. Okay. So if we did a garbage disposal, you'll pay for the garbage disposal. Wow. If we did an air conditioning replacement, you'll pay the cost of the plan. Uh -huh. <coughs> that makes sense. Yeah. And if it falls out of escrow, you guys are taking kind of a risk on yes. that, aren't you? Well, that's kind of fair and reasonable. It's kind of freaking me out. But let me, let, me, let me just back up a little bit here. So for 50 bucks, do I get the check thing that I put? Yep. 
And it sits in there, certified. Yep. You can get sign writers. You can get guys, tickets. guys, uh, for fifty bucks. bucks. What was that? Five of them in a month. She'll, she'll buy you. Oh, okay. We spent twenty minutes on this one. Well, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What well, sounds well, good? Well, that's tie-in too. Yeah. Well, it is a tie-in. This, is, a tie -in. this is, is actually part of. Class. This is actually part of the class. Uh, no. <laughs> no, it is because it's we're talking about listing coverage and we're talking kind of about listings and getting listings yeah. and all of that kind of stuff. Okay. All right. So when you guys have questions, you have my. Does anybody have any questions? My information's here. It's overwhelming for some, so there are not any questions that are not relevant. So feel free to ask me. Please all right. Thank you so much, and thank you for lunch. All right, so how's everybody doing today? Good. You guys all doing good? Yeah. Ready to learn? Yeah. All right, <laughs> that sounds good. Okay, so I've been selling real estate for 20 years in the Valley. I started back in the day, I kind of got into it full on around 9-11 because that's when, uh, you know, I was kind of part-time real estate, kind of working my way in. By the way, did everybody sign in? Mm -hmm. Okay, here, let's pass this around. So, um, here, I'll put this up here for you. Thank you. You got it. So, <clears throat> I was working in a resort business, and I did that for like 10 years in Scottsdale. I handled pharmaceutical companies, medical equipment companies, got them to bring big meetings and stuff. Then when 9-11 happened, of course, that job was like pretty much done. Uh, so then I went to work for uh, Century 21. That was my first gig. I was there for eight years, um, learned kind of everything that there is to learn in real estate. I did really great for the first couple of years. Then the, of course, in 2000 and what was it? Six, seven, mm -hmm. market crashed. And uh, so it was funny because I had just gotten into real estate and I made a bunch of money, more money than I ever made in my life. And of course, what did I do? I spent it. Oh yeah, I went out and bought all kinds of stuff, man. Cabin, uh, let's see, I think we spent eight thousand dollars on a rug turkish rug that was back when everything was tuscan right now my house is modern okay so we that's you really you spent eight thousand dollars on a rug yes that's a whole other story that rug? yeah the whole tuscan now now the modern that's cool yeah yeah. So yeah yeah curtains god curtains are so damn expensive when you're okay. doing your house i can't believe it but anyway so uh, but i learned my lesson because then the market crashed right and I had like, I don't know, I think my monthly nut was about 12000 a month and I had $500 in the bank and uh, no money coming in. So it was a little scary. So um, anyways, that's when I went to uh, HomeSmart because the fees at Century 21 were too expensive and I couldn't support paying the broker and all that kind of stuff. So I went to HomeSmart. I was there for eight years. I was a uh, branch manager at a couple of the different branches there and everything. And then I came here about three years ago. Love it here. It's a great place. Um, but I've always been kind of a listing guy. I do buyers too, but I've been pretty much a listing guy. And I have found that the, the best thing to do um, when you're trying to get a listing and trying to pull comps and all that kind of stuff is to be really streamlined and simple. When I first got into the business and I didn't really know a lot and I didn't have a lot of confidence, um, I put together like a really fancy like presentation, real slick and sexy looking and all that kind of stuff. And I had it on a laptop and I would go in there with a laptop and show it to everybody and kind of go through all of this kind of stuff. And as time went on, you know, that worked a little bit, but it was more for me, I think, than the clients. But the problem was that it put up a barrier between me and the clients. You know what I mean? Because it's a, they were looking at the laptop and we weren't like looking at each other. And so what I'm going to show you guys today is a super streamlined, super easy, 20 years I've narrowed it down from being really fancy to pretty much the bare bones, which allows me to be able to connect more with the sellers when I'm in the, in the home with them, right? So I, I, I want you guys to look at this and you might kind of go, oh, you know, that's kind of there, but it really, really does work. And I encourage all of you guys to try and streamline your presentations 
instead of going in with something too big and too much. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Does anybody have any questions right now? I mean, what, what do you guys want? What are you hoping to get out of this class today? Me? You. Um, just for me, it's tough to pull comps, and I work with a much more tenured agent. And so. Much more what? Tenured agent. Okay. She's been in business for a lot longer. So when she does it and she shows me, she kind of moves through pretty quick. Glosses over it. Well, I mean, she's gone in depth, but it just, until I do it. A bunch of times. A bunch of times, it's going to be more difficult. So I'm just not really confident in, you know, and I feel like that's a huge responsibility. It is. So getting that kind of right number, that right range. Okay. Um, so really just getting better at that. So you just kind of want to see how I do it. Mm -hmm. Okay, how about you? Um, exactly the same. Comps for different purposes, comps for listing presentation, mm -hmm. comps for buyers, mm -hmm. comps for farming area. Right. Just, uh, variations of comps and techniques. And that's a good point because you know what we're not only pulling up comps for listings but we're pulling up comps for our buyers as well right we want our buyers to be able to be confident so and it's super important I know a lot of agents don't do this did you have a question? Oh okay you raise your hand a little bit so I thought I'm, I'm, I'm watching it I'm watching it so um, you know one thing that's super important I know a lot of agents don't do this especially in this market where the market's moving so fast and if you're in like the you know 300,000 250 to 300 everything's going at asking price or over and all this kind of stuff and you're like well, what's the even point of pulling comps right but you still want to pull comps for those buyers before they write an offer and you want to send those comps to them you got to go through the steps don't cut corners <coughs> just because the market is really fast yes ma'am yeah, and with me, it's more like um, re remodel homes. It, right now, it's becoming really hard. I can't comp like um, what I want to get out of this class is okay. So this house is 180, not remodeled. It's a, it's like a little outdated, but right. not all torn up. And this house is being sold remodeled at this price, and I'm missing that. And we've already missed a few right. possible buys because, because you're because you're thinking I'm being too conservative when I could possibly push it, you know, right. push the market a little bit. Right. But how do I find that comp? That right. Oh, I know, I it. know. And we'll try that. We'll do that. The, her question was, if you guys didn't all hear it, is that her and her team buy houses to fix them up and improve the neighborhoods and then resell them. So how do I find and how do I know how much to pay for this and how much am I going to get? Right? When the time comes to sell the house. Remodeled, yeah. Right, yeah. after I remodel the house. That's a very, very tough business. And in fact, I'm gonna give you my business card and I want you to um, I want you to send me an email. Because okay. I'm gonna give you the name of a guy across the hall from me who does that oh, perfect. every single Thank day. You. Yes, he'd be a better uh, answer to that because I honestly, uh, What's that? May I get oh, sure. Absolutely. The yeah, there you go. Yeah, absolutely. Here, just go ahead and pass them around. And you guys can all take one if you want one. So, um, yeah, I, I would not, you know, that's a very, very specialized slice of the market. I'll get to you in a second. And, uh, and it's really risky right now because things are so expensive. And the problem is, uh, you know, there's a couple of things. There's ratcheting back on the appraisals. You know, that's the biggest thing right now, is people can price them up at here, but will they appraise? You know, and the appraisers are kind of ratcheting things back. So you just gotta be super careful and all that kind of stuff. But I'm gonna give you the name of a guy. He does that every day and he's very successful, okay? Yeah. But I'll help you pull comps. You'll, you'll watch me pull comps anyways. Anybody else? What, why are you here? Oh yeah, that's right. That's right, I almost forgot. You're avoiding me. You know, no, I'm not. I'm sorry, Carl. I was, yes, all I was going to say was to, to support that. Yes. To make it a simpler conversation. Yeah. Would be to say, hey, I've got an older house in this neighborhood. <clears throat> the newer homes are selling. How do I address that type of a comp in relationship to a repair value or a future repair value? Absolutely and that's true. Really difficult. I get it. But, yeah. You know, it's I, extremely I, difficult. You know. Yeah, because you got a home that's in an older <laughs> neighborhood. And we all know that the comps pull those oh, down, yeah. right? Right, because you have this gem in the neighborhood. And so yeah. it's just risky, you just gotta be careful. Yeah. I can tell you, you'll sell it quick. It's gonna sell in a nanosecond, but will it appraise? 
And that's the big thing right there. So Randy will be able to help you with that. He's great. You're going to like Randy. So uh, what about you? What are you here for? Just tips to get a, you know, get a better yeah get a better grasp on stuff okay all right well we'll jump into it guys so um i'm going to <coughs> show you a listing and i'm just going to walk you through it okay and i want you guys to stop me if i go too fast okay now there's a couple of different ways that i arrive at a price and i'm just going to kind of take you through it here. So, and this could be either for a buy or a sell. So, I'm going to go into uh, the MLS. I'll put in the address. One zero. Oops. Where's the num lock? Is there a num lock? Numlock. There it is. Okay. Greenway. Okay, this is one of my listings that I just put under contract. So I'll just use this one as an example. Okay, so here's the listing. It's up in McDowell Mountain Ranch. Okay, you guys see that? Everybody see this okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, so the house is up in McDowell Mountain Ranch. So I'm gonna take you through the steps that when I <clears throat> was getting ready to go do the listing uh, that I went through. And it's the same for buyers, it's the same for sellers. So here's the house. Now what you can do is you can go and if a home has been on the market before, obviously you can pull up the old listing and get an idea of what it looks like. So the question is, you know, when you go out to the initial listing appointment, and I'll talk listing appointment right now, um, you know, how do you give them a price without seeing the house? They're going to say, well, how do you know what my house is worth without even seeing my house first, right? So what you're going to tell the client in the initial phone call before you go out is you're going to say, hey, I'm going to do a little bit of research and I'm going to come out with a range of what the price should be on your house. And then when I come out and I actually see your house, then I'll be able to nail the price uh, better that way. That way you don't have to do two trips out there, right? Not that I'm being lazy, but I just think it's better just to kind of go out in one swoop and get it done. So you tell them, I'll give you a range, okay? <clears throat> so let's say this was the old MLS now, and in this case, they were the original owners of the property. So that makes it a little bit more complicated, right? Because there is no pictures, right? Because it's never been on the market before, so it's never been the MLS. So in a case like that, you might ask them, have you, you know, done any major upgrades? Can you send me some pictures and all this kind of stuff, okay? So, so let's say that this one has been on the market before and you pull this up. The first thing I will do is I will go into Monsoon, which I'm sure all of you guys have done this, right? Mm -hmm. And then you go to comparables. You guys done this? Yes. Okay. So this is like the first swoop that I will do. Okay, I go through three different swoops before I decide which is which, okay? So now these are the solds. Now solds is the only thing that really matters when pricing a house, okay? Things that have sold in the last six months or sooner are really the only thing that really, really matters. Go ahead. I would say competition, I apologize for disagree, but don't you look at the active listings because if you have th five active listings close to this price, apparently if you want to pass sale, you have to drop down a little bit. If right. there is zero listings, then you can afford to go a little bit higher right. because of the demand. And it depends how many UCBs, how many pendings, uh, how fast the houses are selling, how fast the market is moving. So we look. I personally will look at all those. Absolutely, and what she said, if you guys didn't hear her, is I said the only thing that really matters are closed listings, which is true yes. for price-wise. But what you said, which she is right, and we're gonna get to that next, is what about the actives and the pendings, okay? Yeah, the actives and the pendings also do, to a certain extent, 
uh, can be used as a data point, but not really to set the price. Okay, because what happens is people, uh, other agents, we don't know what the level of expertise of these agents are and all this kind of stuff. And what I've been seeing, I don't know what you guys have been seeing, but what I've been seeing is that a house that's completely remodeled sells for $300,000. And then the guy in the same neighborhood just put his house on the market active for three twenty-five, and he's not updated. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Because they're saying, "Well, this is the price. Oh, the market's going up. Yeah, you know." So uh, in this case, it's funny that you mentioned that because on this house, I wanted to price it at a certain price, and then the neighbor two doors down went on for nine hundred thousand dollars, and then the seller goes, "Well, hey, this guy's nine hundred thousand. We should be, you know." <laughs> And I'm like, okay, well, we wound up putting the house $80,000 higher than I wanted to. Then they sat on the market yeah. for two months, mm -hmm. right? Because they thought this other house, and then the other house is still on the market, still hasn't sold, and then they're going down, 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 down. But that's a whole other story. But you are right to take into account what the others are going at. And how I use that, you guys, is like when you're doing the listing, and everybody else goes, oh, well, look, this guy's listed at this number, right? Way high. Instead of me going, oh, they're crazy, you know, it'll never sell at that price and all that, because they always think we have an ulterior motive. We just want to get a quick sale and get paid. That's what they believe, right? When you go in and you try and get them to price it right. So what you'll say in a case like that, when somebody, when they're, well, look at all these actives. Why do you want me to price it here when my neighbor's at here? Okay, what you'll say is, guess what? That is a gift to you. That your neighbor is pricing that house way high over these comps that we see right now. That's a gift to you because it's gonna make you look that much better. Right, so don't say, oh, you know, they're crazy, they're insane, that's never gonna happen because they're gonna think you have an ulterior motive. You can say, hey, I'm glad they priced it at that price because guess what? Based on what we're looking at here, and these are the facts, these are what things are selling for, these are what they're appraising for, that's what your price should be, okay? Mm -hmm. So don't ever tell the client that person's crazy for over, you know, for way high pricing their house. That's a gift to you, Mr. Client, right? We're not gonna get into that game, okay? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. And I have another question. For yes. Usually we get a very wide spread and the properties included probably, uh, it's too general. We are outside of the comps area, I think, in many of the listings. Um, I don't know, also. sometimes. Do you guys know what the what the basic criteria is for pulling comps? Square footage location and pool. Okay, here's the, here's the basics, mm -hmm. you ready? You want to go within a one mile radius of the property. One mile radius of the property. Don't go outside the one mile radius unless you have to. Now, where would you go outside the one mile radius? Maybe North Scottsdale, where everything's on acre properties? Mm -hmm. Custom homes. You could have a good one. What's that? Custom homes. Custom homes. You might go outside the area. They're on bigger lots, so it's kind of a different area, right? So. Pulling comps is like horseshoes. You just get close. You got to kind of look at the comps. You got to kind of look at things, and then you got to use a hunch and your experience in the market. You may want to talk to somebody like Carl, who's been in the business for a long, long time. He'll be able to have some good, uh, you know, foresight for you on something like that. So, um, but yeah, you're going to want to basically be in a standard neighborhood, which is what most of us do. You're going to be one mile radius or smaller. Okay, you're gonna wanna have, if it's a single story house, you gotta comp single story houses. You can't do a single to a two, okay? Um, you're gonna wanna be within about the same square footage. So let's say it's a 2,700 square foot house, I would take 25 to 3,000, right? Do you do a normal percentage depending on the size? I mean, when you're doing it randomly on the computer, you're going to take 10% for a smaller home, 15% for yeah. and a larger home, you go to 20%. Exactly. So like what you guys see here, I have sold in the last three months and 10%. So what you're going to do here, you're like, and we'll just kind of look at it. So see, right here, if I took it down small, you always want to try and stay smaller, smaller, smaller. 
So uh, first of all, you stay in the same subdivision, right? You want to try that first. So these are all in the same subdivision, so that's good. Yeah. And see, we have three of them that have sold in the last three months. Okay, so that's better. You could go out six months and pull some if you don't have enough. You could go out six months and see what things are. Now see, if you look at this, if you just look at this, you know, it's pretty common sense. You'd probably want to take these before you would take those, right? Because mm -hmm. yeah. they're kind of closer, right? Kind of the same neighborhood, kind of the same views and all that kind of stuff, okay? So, but we'll go back to three months right there. And we still have these, right? So these are all the same neighborhood. Crossing, huh? What about when you're crossing a major street or a zip code? Exactly. Yeah, I try yeah. and uh, if you have to cross a major street, I try not to. So let's say something pops up on the other side and it's like on, a, on like let's say something comes up over here, right? Then I might change the three months to six months to try and pull something up that's in here. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. For mm -hmm. example, another just on top of it, in 85254, five, for example, right now between Greenway and Bell within one mile radius, we have houses built in the 70s, late 70s, 80s, 90s. Huge difference. Correct. Different to compare. Right. And then, um, what do they decide? But they are very close, and they, when we pull the comps on uh, monsoon, they pop up. Right, I'll just pull everything up. Monsoon pulls everything up, and we'll yes. show you guys what I do to fix that. Her question was this, so she's talking about 85254. Not only crossing, I will just put that thing, not only make crossing major streets, like either Greenway or right. Road, but on top of it, different Age, Correct. And that's where it gets super difficult. You know, when you have an area like Raskin Estates, which is 85254, and that's Thunderbird to Sweetwater, um, 64th Street to 68th Street. You guys see the Callaways are in there all the time. That's where they work pretty much in kind of that area. Um, it's, it's hard, it's more difficult to comp stuff like that because what you're going to do is you're going to go through layers of comps. So you're going to do something like this first to pull things up, then you're gonna look at them with the pictures, and you're gonna look at the lot sizes, and you're gonna look at this, and you're gonna look at that, and you're gonna use common sense. And that's what this is, this is all common sense. And plus you have to put in your um, you know, knowledge of the market, and what buyers are willing to pay for houses right now, and what you think things will appraise for, okay? So those are good questions. Okay, so let's move on. So we pulled up these comps right here, and then what I do is I would print this out for myself. So you see these comps back back in 105th way, right? So the next thing you do is I go into the regular MLS. <coughs> I go into multiple address, and then I put the addresses in, so I can look at these, okay? Now I guess you could go MLS too, but MLS numbers. 105th, and then, I love that address. That's a cool address, isn't it? Is that um, in the menu, the multiple addresses? Um, yeah. Yes, it is. I like using multiple addresses menu uh, more than anything. It's one of my favorite parts. Who said that? Oh, okay. Who said that? <laughs> Sorry, I didn't mean to sound so sinister when I said that. Yeah, who said that? All right, here we go. So then I hit closed, right? Now, this may pull up, you know, this is pulled up all the ones every time it's closed. So what I'll do is, and I'll go in here, and I'll click on these, boom, and I don't think that one was one of them. And this one, and this one, okay? So now I have the three, right? 
Why didn't pull up the letter? You only listed the, the address and say it's sold more than once. What? Oh, it sold more than once. What? Why did Why did you Why did it pull up so many if it sold? Oh, because some of them have sold multiple times. That's that's got them for like the last ten years. So if you just put closed on there, it's going to pick every time they've closed in the last like ten years or however long it's been in there. So you got to pull up the most recent ones. Did you have a question, Carl? No, sir. Okay, so good. Sorry. I know. I'm looking. I'm like seeing like. Uh -huh movement so I like okay so I pull these up and then what I do is I go through them okay so the first thing I might do is like for instance and then you have your subject property so you already know I'm assuming you already know what your subject property looks like and what it's all about so then I'll click into here and then I'll go back to monsoon again and the first thing I'll do is I will look at the lot okay and I'll zoom in and I'll say okay so, what is it about this lot that makes it better or worse than my subject property? So you'll look at this, you could say, well this backs to Queen's Reef. Queen's Reef is the main drag coming in, and it's not that busy though. And if you know McDowell Mountain Ranch, there's actually a view over here, and backing up to Queen's Reef with your backyard could potentially give you a view. Mm -hmm. So. Okay, so some people might say, well it's a negative, I'll never back up to a road, but other people might be like, you know, I don't want to have somebody behind me and I kind of got a view, right? So you kind of take this into account, right? When you think of it. Uh, what kind of exposure is it? It's basically north-south exposure, right? Sun's going to set to the west, so it's going to set kind of over here, so they're not direct. So, right? So a lot of assumptions here. This is where the art comes in, you guys. So we'll go down to, so we kind of looked at that. So we kind of know the lot's an okay lot. It's not stellar, but it's okay, right? So then we'll go into the pictures, and I'll roll through the pictures, and you just kind of look, okay, the yard is, eh, it's okay. It's not fantastic. It's, you know, it's just kind of okay. And then the inside, builder grade. Look at that shit. <laughs> Purple. Wow. That's bold. Isn't it? Wow. Look at that. What were they thinking? Purple and gray. She likes they weren't thinking. <laughs> they weren't. They must have had some interior designer. I got a listing right now. I couldn't say anything to the sellers. It's on fire wheel. I'll show you guys a picture of it later. But, uh, I mean, every room is a different bold color and all this kind of stuff. And I was, you know, we were, I was going through the initial listing appointment thing and I'm going through it, I'm getting ready to say something. And I go, oh yeah, those colors. And the wife says, oh yes, my daughter flew in from Chicago and she did the whole thing for us. <laughs> so what do you think my next thing was? What did I say? <laughs> Absolutely, oh my God, that is gorgeous, right? Oh, it's gorgeous. Because we don't have to be the bad guy, right? Why should I be the bad guy at the listing appointment? And say, oh, you know, the millennials like gray and white. I mean, we're gonna have to go gray and white. You know, the whole house is gonna have to be repainted. Don't say that. No, just say it's beautiful. And then let, when they do the showings, and people come in and go, oh my God, you know, then let them be the bad guy, right? Be the bad guy, let them be the bad guy. So. Do you What? Do you take into consideration though to kind of educate them in pricing? Like if it was a neutral color or let's just say it was gray and white, how do you have that conversation? Because you have to account for that in the pricing, I would assume. Mm -hmm. You mean like if how how do I have the conversation about what? I mean to go in and say it's it's beautiful, but they're expecting but. <laughs> their house to be the same as a gray and white house. Right. And that's just not yeah. how we're going to You have to really play that out, man, and you got to look for clues when you're in there, okay? Because I have gotten myself, I've gotten myself talked out of more listings over the years because I was trying to be too honest. Okay. You know what I mean? Because I wanted to give people honest advice. I want to, and I do, okay? But I am in the transaction business, right? I got to transact in order to get paid. So at a certain point, you know, you have to think about their feelings, and it's kind of like the first date. 
-huh. right? Do you want to go in and hit them up and go, hey, let's go, yeah. right? Or do you wine them and dine them a little bit, right? <laughs> wine them and dine them a little bit. Sometimes you got to do that, and I know it goes against the grain because we want to always be very transparent. Yes, ma'am. I remember taking a buyer into a house with bright like, turquoise colored carpet, and I'm all ready to say ick, and I said, wow, and she goes, oh yeah, I love it. And I'm like, okay. That was so perfect. <laughs> you just you, know, you might say something, but don't say it positive or negative. Just say something that will elicit to find out what they're thinking. <laughs> right, right. You got to lead them on a little bit. So lay out a trap and kind of see where they're going with it. Because everybody's got a different. You know, that's why they got chocolate ice cream and vanilla ice cream, right? So everybody's different. So and who knows? Maybe somebody will come into my fire my fire wheel listing and go, oh my God, I love all these different colors in every single room. It's so warm inside, you know? So anyway, so I go through and I just kind of look. Now, just so you guys know, what you should do um, before you go out on a listing appointment or before you, know, you do the contract for the buyer is you're gonna want to email them these before you go out to the meeting. So they can sit down and they can go through them on their own and they can look at all this kind of stuff so that when you're in the listing appointment, they're not getting too much information because too much information overload is gonna keep them from signing the listing agreement, okay? So you wanna send it out first so that they have it a couple of days before, or the day before and say, hey, I'm gonna send you this email it's going to have some of the comparable properties that have been selling so you guys can get a feel of the market before I come out. And this is what we're going to talk about, okay? Don't be afraid to do that. They're going to love that when you do this. They're going to go, because nobody else will do that. None of the other agents will do that. They're just going to go out and try and hit them up. So take it slower, a little bit slower, and don't worry about it, okay? So this is a nice house, right? It's kind of okay. The slate isn't going to be for everybody. That was kind of back in the Tuscan era, but it's not horrible. Okay? So you got the three, and then we got this one. Okay? That one's got a little courtyard. Now, see, this one's got more of that modern feel. It's got a nice kitchen. This is what everybody's liking now, right in here. Okay? It's got a good feel to it. It's streamlined, it's light and bright. We all like that stuff now, at least for the next five years, right? Until it gets super Tuscan stuff for the next Right, time. Tuscan <laughs> will come back someday. Wait, 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 there was a remnant of Tuscan. Yeah. Look, there it is, oh. <laughs> there it is. I knew, I knew this was Tuscan at one point. See all that stuff, okay. So anyways, then what I'll do, so you got this list right here, right? Of the three houses, these are the three, okay? So you print this and you set this aside, but before you set it aside, you're going to go up to the CMA and you know how you have a statistical CMA? You guys done this before? Okay. The statistical CMA will show you <clears throat> these are the closed properties and these are the comparables really and they were listed at 264 a square. They sold at 261 a square. Average days on market was 185 days, okay? Now you're going to use this later on in your presentation. So you're going to print this out and you're going to have this, okay? So you guys saw how I did that? Let me just do it again here. So I went from, hopefully this one. Yeah, if you close it, we'll just go back to it. Yeah. Okay, good. So we have these three. You highlight those, click them. You print out the one line thing so it looks like this. Right? And then you go up to your CMA, statistical CMA, and then you print that out so it looks like that. Okay? And you're going to bring these in to either your buyer or your lister. So those are the solds. Okay? Now, on the other way I do it, that's just the first way. Okay? These are pretty straightforward. The second thing I will do. And then I meld these together. In this case, this one was pretty simple because they really pulled some good comps up just on the regular comp thing on the MLS. <clears throat> but I take it a step further because especially you guys when, uh, like you're in Raskin Estates, 85254, 
places like that, you're going to want to do a secondary search. And then you might put these together. You know, sometimes, especially if I'm doing a <coughs> some luxury property in North Scottsdale or something like that, or let's say I'm in um, let's say I'm in Mesa, okay, and I'm looking at homes in the two fifty to three hundred thousand dollar range in Mesa where you have new stuff and old stuff and manufactured and trailer parks and all this kind of stuff, right? So that's where it gets really more complicated. So we'll do the regular basic comps just like I did there. Then I'll go in and I'll do a quick search. Do you guys, have you guys ever done a map search? Okay, so you know that the quick search and the map search are now combined, okay? So this is what's important. So you'll go in here and then I'll do a map search. Okay, so on the map search, I'll go, I'll look for closed. I won't put in the list price, of course. Uh, it's going to be a single family detached. And then we'll go into bedrooms. Mine is a three bedroom, three bath. So we'll go three bedroom. Uh, why is that not working? So we'll go three bedroom. Now, if you can't pull, I'm going to go three bath. I'm going to go three bedroom, three bath. But if you can't pull up enough, three bedroom, three bath. See, are you leaving? I am. I'm sorry. I got an appointment. That's okay. Hope you sell something. Good luck. Thank you. Thanks. See ya. Bye. Okay. So three bedroom, three bath. Now, if it doesn't pull up enough with three bath, go two and a half or two. You know, because you can always, you can always narrow your search. So I guess my uh, advice is to do as broad a search as possible at first, and then ratchet it back from there if you get too much. Okay. So I'll go three bedroom, three bath. Uh, this one's twenty seven hundred square feet. So I'll go like twenty five hundred to three thousand. Number of interior levels. Since this one's a single. We're going to go max single story, okay? I uh, leave the year built out. We can always go back and do that if we get too much stuff, okay? And then garage spaces. Now we know that there's a big price break between a two car and a three car garage, isn't there? It really surprises uh, people. The reason being, they got to be, especially if they're a single story, they're going to be on a larger lot, right? So that's what's going to kind of raise the value. Plus, everybody, nobody wants a two-car anymore. So <laughs> I know. So since this one is a three-car, we'll go three-car. And if we can't find enough, then we can always go back and ratchet it back to two-car garages, right? Okay. You guys, have any questions yet? Am I doing okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. I usually leave pools out for the initial search. Okay. Now in this case, because this thing is in the McDowell Mountain Ranch area, okay, just to kind of zero things in, there's two ways you can do this. You can either go over here and put the address into the house itself and do a one mile radius, or you can just go to the subdivision and put in McDowell Mountain Ranch. Oops. Did I do that right? I got mountain. Okay. So we did McDowell Mountain Ranch. Now what you'll see, see this little thing? So now now it's pulling up. Oh, and let me go like this. We got closed. And then we're gonna go off market date. And we'll go six months. Okay? So this is the other way now. So this is like the secondary search. So then I'll go like this. I'll pull these up. Right? Go into this. And now you have another list to go through. Right? To narrow down. So what you'll do is you'll compare this list to the list that the MLS pulled up in the tax records. Right? And then see if there's some that are better that make more sense when you go through things. Okay. So now you've seen how we just go to the tax records and pull up the comps 
in the top comps area. Then you saw how I did a map search to pull up even additional ones. Then you take those two and you blend those together. Okay, and then you come up with three or four good ones. Now you do this both for closed, but you also do it, like you were mentioning earlier, for the actives and the pendings. Okay, because the actives and the pendings, you have to make sure that your buyers or sellers know that actives and pendings honestly don't mean a thing. Okay, they will give you an indication though of what other people, what the competition is. Okay, and if you're getting a listing, it's a great idea to set yourself up a filter on the MLS that will send you automatically when anything changes with any of those listings that are your competition. Okay, that way when you're talking to your sellers during your listing appointment, you'll be able to tell them, hey, this is the competition right here. And I'm going to be watching them. In fact, every morning the first thing I do is I get a cup of coffee, I sit in front of my computer, and I look at every one of the ones that you're competing with, and I let you know if anything has changed. And it's going to be super easy for you because they automatically come to you. So if they do a price change, you're going to know that. And guess what? Your clients are going to love you when you call them up and you go, hey, guess what? So-and-so just dropped their price $5,000. It's Friday. Let's go $6,000 down. Let's be one step ahead of them and let's make this happen. Okay? And you're going to tell your clients that during your listing appointment that that's what you do. Okay? And when you're up against a big guy like me, it's going to be easy for you to say, oh, you know, he's got 20 listings. If he loses one or two, he doesn't care. You know, if that one or two is yours, pay. he's still going to make $400,000. He doesn't care. You're going to be one of my two listings, and I'm going to watch you like a laser beam, and I'm going to get your house sold. I'm going to give you better attention than any of these other big agents out there, right? That's going to be your guy's strength. Is The strength is that you don't have a ton of things out. Maybe you do. I don't know. Maybe you guys do. Maybe you don't. But if you don't, the biggest strength I had when I was brand new into the business was I was like, guess what? You're my only client. <laughs> you get 100% of my attention. And people are scared of that because we always want to feel like, you know, we want to have the fancy car and we want to look like we're successful and all that kind of stuff, right? And we're scared of those big agents, but don't let them scare you. Let the client know. And by the way, when you're doing it low tech like this, you're going to be able to connect with the client so that they can, you know, so it's not this big fancy thing, okay? Yes? So, in this example, you had three with the, the monsoon search, and you had eight in this search, so you with the map search. What do you, how do you stratify what you start giving on when you don't have three and eight that are right there available for you? Mm -hmm. What do you give on? Is it the square footage? Is it the number of bedrooms? What's your assessment of that? Right, so like if you could only find what, one or two? Right, correct. Okay, yeah, this is where the hunch has to come in, okay? This is where you got to look at the properties. His question was, if you don't have the comps out there, what do you do if you don't have the comps, you know? Uh, you, can, you can pull ones, you, if you can't find any comps, you can go either further out, you know, just cascade out to a several mile, go a mile and a half, two miles. You can give, so you can give on location. Well, well I understand very much, but which one is, is I guess, going to keep you more accurate to your price? Right. right. So if I know, I was just doing this yesterday, I was looking at homes where I know that they're built you know, by a decade or, or so earlier. I was trying to stay within the neighborhood. I just couldn't find any comps. I go across the street, and now I'm into much bigger homes that were built much uh, sooner yeah, or more recently, bigger lots, totally different realm. So is it right for me to try to stay in there and go back further in time and go back six months, maybe even push that a little bit? Yes. Or do I just stay within that three-month time frame and go across the street where homes that are just completely different? Yes. No, I would go back in time further. Okay. Yep. I would go back in time further okay. and try and keep it where the homes are more same age, same type, and all that, rather than jump across the street. And same concept if you're not finding the same number of bedrooms and bathrooms begin to give on those values That's versus correct. you versus you start jumping into homes that are just simply not the same. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's Absolutely right. Yeah. Yes. Yes. 
in this case, but also in general, do you uh, add the, for, uh, in the when you price a property, a listing, do you keep in mind the appreciation or depreciation? For example, we are in an upcoming market. We know that uh, for the past four or five months, uh, the properties went up by 10%. When you list, when you price the, a listing, do you add these 10% on top of what you had sold four, five, six, ten months ago? Maybe. It really depends. Okay. So her question was, we know the market's going up a certain percentage. Do you add that to it? Not really. What I do is I'll look at the comps and I'll tell the client, this is what you should list the house at. We can go a little higher if you want than what these recent sales have been, you know, but it's a dangerous game, you know, because you always have to appraise. So if you have a house and that's the whole, that whole thing, you know, if, if the homes are selling at $250 a square foot and you put your house on the market and it's similar to the other ones, are you going to list it at 260 a square foot? You might list it at that, but let the client know that it's going to probably sell for less. Okay. But I hope I answered your question. I mean, so when you have like older houses in an area that are surrounded by newer houses, you're going to go back further in time on the older houses to find ones that are similar, even if you have to go back a year. Okay. And a year, yeah, and a year honestly is not accurate for appraisal purposes, but sometimes appraisers do do that. They'll make an adjustment and say, yeah, this one was a year, it's really kind of outside the realm, but it's close enough. Right, and I guess, it, you know, because there's so many variables that you kind of go through, and, and even to, um, is it if it's three versus four bedroom, right. versus one versus two story, right. which one should I vary there first? Yes, you're gonna go, you're, you're gonna go one story all the time. Okay. So if you have a one story listing, you're always, or one story opportunity, you're always gonna want to compare it to one story houses. Uh, you can't really compare it to a two-story. Okay. You got it. Even if you have to go outside the area, outside the age, and everything else. Yes, ma'am. Is there a simple, um, I guess, list of rules to follow where you have your pool is a fifteen thousand dollar hit either way, right? Yep. You have uh, a bedroom is how much, and how do you? Do, I've seen so many different ways. Okay. That. Yeah, the basic ones that you guys need to know, like, okay, what? How much value does a certain thing add? To a property, okay. A pool will add anywhere between five to eight thousand dollars. That's about it. Most people are surprised by that, but that's the truth. Five to eight thousand dollars. What I tell my sellers most of the time is that hey, it's going to sell your house quicker, but it doesn't add a lot of value. And when people are buying houses, you know, and I'm talking to them, they'll say, well, I can always buy this house and put a pool in later. And I say, well, yeah, you can do that, but you know, just being completely transparent, you're going to pay twenty-five thousand dollars for the pool, and when you go to sell the house in five to seven years, which is the average, it's going to be worth about five. Mm -hmm. So it's 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 not a great investment, but if you like the pool, that's great. But I want you to know that. But let's try and find one with a pool, if we can, because that would be a better investment for you as a buyer. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, a uh, bedrooms. You know, a two bedroom and a three bedroom are completely different animals. I would just go off what the comps are and what things have been selling for in the area as far as that goes and cost per square foot. Generally, a two bedroom uh, isn't as desirable as a three bedroom for most people. Uh, it's getting to the point now where people don't even want two car garages. Everybody <laughs> wants a three car garage now. It's like insane. But um, what other features are you thinking about in particular other than a pool? Well, square footage too, just mm -hmm. in general, right? So I've seen where someone will take um, the overall square footage and divide it by the cost per square foot in their comps and use an algorithm that way. Um, but yeah, I would say those are the big things. But my bedrooms, garages, yeah. you, know, but you made a comment that there's a huge price break in a two car versus a three car. Right. What does that look like in a quantifiable? Yeah, you're usually, you know, a three car garage is usually going to add ten to fifteen thousand dollars to a house. Yeah. What about a garage versus a carport? Yeah, you know, I guess it depends on the area of town you're in. Um, you know, typically uh, carports are less desirable, and of course, it's going to be less money than a two car garage. Um, but let's say, what area of town are you thinking of? 
Moon Valley. Okay, because Moon Valley, you know, there's a lot of places with carports and all that kind of stuff. I think a garage would probably add 8,000, you know, over, over a carport. Something well, like that. It will cost about eight thousand to get one built just to enclose yeah. a carport. Yeah, yeah. We so lost a lot of fires because we didn't put a, um, in the Valley area because we didn't put a garage. We didn't close the carport. Mm. They bought others around just right. They that? liked our house better, right. but they only bought the others because they had they had the garage. garage. Yeah, it was selling quicker. Just like a pool sells a house faster. Uh, how much does it cost to enclose a garage? A two car garage. Five thousand. Okay. I there she yeah. gives you she'll she'll know what it costs mm -hmm. to update stuff mm -hmm. so that's great so yeah so you, it'll cost you five you'll get about eight out of it right and it'll sell the house quicker yeah. so okay so um so you guys have seen how i do the map search you saw how i did it um with the mls on those comps and then i kind of put everything together and then i come up with what i believe would be a good uh, potential asking price for the house. Now let me show you, uh, where's my handouts? Do I have them up here? Okay, now this is what I give to the client. And I know this looks very um, kind of low tack, but it works great. Here you go. I won't get too wet there. <laughs> Thank you. Can everybody get my card? Who wants it? Okay. Okay, one second. Yes. 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 Okay, yes. Do you use the 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 uh CMI view the view? Yes? No, 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 below. The residential view, you get residential view now? When you scroll down. Like in your rental. Oh. Okay. You have the CMA view. Okay, what are you talking about now? Okay. You want to come up here and show me? Right there, scroll the, the arrow. Go to residential view. Here. I just said drop down boxes. Residential versus rental. CMA. Hmm. I've never done that before. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, what does that do? Uh, it gives you actually, for me, it's. Uh, oh, it gives you the life. Yeah, yeah, the process for uh, the so this kind of CMA, oh, I just oh, want to pick up. No, no, that's okay. This is the one that I do. I do this one right here. Yes. Yeah, this is like a little map. Yeah, it's a little bit different. I just give them this one. Okay. That's why I give them this one. Now, what I do, you guys, is I go in, okay, and. And after I've gotten the actives and the pendings and the solds, I have two little packets that I give the sellers when I go in there. I have the active and pending, and I have this one. And I just hand it to them. So we don't have any barriers between us. They just have a piece of paper. And we can look each other in the eye, and we can talk, and they can ask questions. They've already had an opportunity to look at all of the listings that are on here, right? And then I just pr pretty much narrow it down. And I put on the sheet, if you look at this one right here, and you guys can do this any way you want, okay? But this is so clear for the clients, and literally I've tried so many different fancy things on this over the years, but it really boils down to just people being across the table from each other, right? Old school. Did you have a question earlier? I just need a card. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, um, I'll get one later. Go ahead. Yeah, no, here it is. There it is. There you go. So, anyways, so as you can see what I've done here is I put what the actives are, right? What the pendings, and then what the closed are. And they look at that. And so, if you look at this one right here, you'll see that the actives, the average days on market was 145 days, right? List price per square foot was 255 a square. You look at the next one down, the pendings, right? They are at 37 days on the market, and their list price is $287 a square foot. So then if you look down to the closed, and it's 63 days on market, $259 a square foot. So what does this tell you right off the bat when you look at these statistics? 
What are the seller going to think? The houses are going to sell quickly. The actives. Yeah, the actives are. Well, why would, oh, okay. Does this take into consideration though a price change? This or is taking into consideration what? A price change or current? This is current. So it's coming down. Right. right. These are saying. the currents. So what this is showing you guys is that the closed were 63 days on the market average. The actives are 145 days on the market, right? So the market's what? Is it speeding up? No, it's slowing down. That's right. So we took all these statistics, we narrowed it down to this, and this is really simple for them to see. Now you can put it in a fancier form if you want, rather than handwrite it like I do. But basically, the market is slowing down pretty dramatically up there. And the sales price per square foot was 259. The actives are now at 255, and they're still not selling. So what does that tell you? Prices are going down. Right. Everything's overpriced in there, too. Right? Because the prices are going down. Now, what's interesting is there's this one pending that sold right away at a higher cost per square foot. But you can go in and you can show that and say, well, yeah, this one was completely this, completely that. But you're not that. <laughs> you got to do it in a nice way, <laughs> right? You got to do it in a nice way. What you would say about something like this is, "Hey, that one was an outlier, and that you know that will help a little bit." But we want to be in front of the rest of these, right? So you're giving these people advice. You're going to go in and you're going to you're going to say, "Look, you know, the average days on market is 145 days. They're pushing six months." Now people were surprised, these sellers were surprised when I showed them up in McDowell Mountain Ranch that the average days on market for their competition was six months. Mm -hmm. They were blown away. They're like, wait a second, everything's selling in days over the asking price. People are lined up out the door. It's not the case, guys. Some areas, yeah. Some areas, yeah. Some price ranges. Yeah, absolutely. If you're in the seven to nine hundred thousand dollar price range, you're in for a you're long <laughs> ride. Yeah, there's not a lot of people that can afford a house like that. So you have to kind of tell your clients that if it's a more expensive house, you know, you can make them feel good by telling them, "Look, there's not a lot of people that can afford a house like you can," <laughs> and it's the truth. Mm -hmm. You know, and that will make them feel a little bit better. But you got to tell them this also. You got to say, "Look." The home prices are going, everybody's overpriced in the neighborhood. This is what I told these people. I said, everybody's overpriced in the neighborhood. I go, and they're all going to start reducing their prices pretty soon because they're all getting scared. And you're going to start seeing everybody at the six month mark, people are going to start dropping their price. And you want to be in front of that. You want to be the next guy to sell. So what we have to do is we got to price this house right the first time. Let's here's the prices. Let's go a little bit under, and let's be the next one to sell. Because guess what? I know it sounds counterintuitive, and I'm telling you guys on the side, this is the absolute truth. You price the house right, and it's lower than what those other ones are that have on the market 148 days. Your seller is going to wind up making more money because their house is going to sell next. And then the other guys are all going to be in this fight for the bottom to get that next buyer, right? And it's going to go down, 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 down. And then what happens? Then the comps are down. Then it gets even, then it's this whole thing. So you don't want to be in a race to the bottom with your listing. You want to stay in front of that. You're going to tell them, I'm going to be watching this competition every single day because you're going to get those automatic emails that come into you, right? And you're going to make that happen. So I give them this simple printout where I handwrite everything and then I give them a range over here on the right hand side where I say okay now that I've seen your house um, I have a range of prices here so I'm gonna warn you guys don't ever go to the bottom of the range okay after you see the house <laughs> always just say say oh you know okay here's the range but you know, your house isn't here. Your house is probably here, right? In the middle somewhere, right? You don't want to insult people. Everybody loves their house. They don't know you that well yet. So you give them a range. And a lot of times what I will do is I will give somebody 
a, uh, a 30 day price. This is what, if we price it at here, we got a good chance of selling it in the next 30 days. If we price it here, we got a good chance of selling it in the 90 days. And if we price it here, it's gonna be six months plus. Based on not what you're saying, based on what's selling, okay? So give them that range. I used to just go in and give them one number. And that's not good. Give them choices so that they can be in control. That's the one thing that sellers, I'll get you in a sec. That's the one thing that sellers are always uh, scared is losing control of the whole situation. Yes, sir. Do you ever, so you're giving them the, there are three prices, right? Let's say, let's go for the price at 90 days. Mm -hmm. You ever say, okay, 90 days, could be 90 days, could be longer. Let's say it's six months. Uh, you have a mortgage on it. $750,000, you're at $4,000 a month mortgage, so mm -hmm. you're paying $4,000 for the next six months. That's right. So you need to add that on top of what? <coughs> that might help the oh. you. That's a very good point. Let's what he's saying it. is the cost of ownership of the property. If you want to price it here, you're going to have six more months worth of this potentially that you would might not have if you have this. And that's a great conversation to have. And you'll see that conversation come up after they get on the market and they've kind of been through things and they start getting beat up by people coming in and out and, you know down in their house and all this kind of stuff so you can always have those conversations i think it's great to have that conversation look at the whole uh, enchilada so that's super important super important but anyway so yeah if you give them a range like that then that gives them uh more control yes ma'am Different question on the difference in prices yes. for the 90 or 30, 90 in six months. Right. How, I mean, I guess it would depend on the price of the house, obviously, but how far apart are those? Usually it depends on the price, but I'll usually base it on what, and this is where the actives and pendings can come in. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's where the actives and pendings, because what I generally do is I want to list the house at the same price that they've been selling at. Okay, because we're in a quick market. So I'm going to price the house pretty much at the same cost per square foot as what they've been selling for. I'm not going to add money to that, typically. So if they want to go 90 days, then I might look at the, what the actives are, and I might put it at what everybody else is asking at 90 days, if it's within reason. You know, and all of this, like I said, a lot of this is hunch, a lot of this is just being in the market, a lot of this is just kind of, you know, get, staking the claim and then seeing what the feedback is and then making adjustments. One thing you can tell your clients uh, as far as pricing, because, you know, the price always changes as, as we get through the transaction, is, hey, we should be getting two to three showings a week on your house. If we're not getting two to three showings a week on your house, you're overpriced. Yeah. Okay, if we're getting two to three showings a week on your house and we go three or four weeks and we don't have an offer, we're overpriced. Okay, so two to three showings a week, if you're not getting those, you're overpriced. If you are getting those and you're not getting an offer in like two to three weeks, you're overpriced. And I tell you, you know what, it's actually the truth. It actually really, it really does work. It's, it's as simple as that. So, uh, and, and you can tell your clients that, so that way they can kind of feel it, you know, if they're not getting these showings, then they already know, because you've already told them ahead of time, this is what we should be getting, all right? And it's gonna help you guys too, it's gonna help you get more money for your clients, because they're gonna keep that thing priced right, they're gonna stay on top of it, don't just let it sit there, guys, and don't be scared to go into the client and get those price reductions when you need to, because if you don't, market's <coughs> gonna leave them behind and uh, they're going to get much less money for their house. So what you just said about the two to three showings per week, the having no offer in 30 days, right? that's setting expectations. Right. Right. So what other things do you do to set expectations as far as what they can do as you're going down that path? Right. Days pass, 30 days pass, 60 days pass. Mm -hmm. What kind of adjustments besides price? Maybe it's this, that, or the other. What right. kind of conversations do you have? Yeah, and that's a good question. So what he asked is, okay, so the house isn't selling, what do you do now? You know, how do you set the expectations on the front end to get that ready so it goes smooth? Yeah. 
And so what I've always done, you guys, is I've always done the maximum when it comes to the clients, because I've never, ever, ever, ever wanted to be accused of being lazy, mm -hmm. of getting something for nothing, and it's my duty to do the best I can for my clients, but it's more of a personal thing, because um, the one thing I hate the most is if somebody would ever try and accuse me of not doing everything I possibly could to get a house sold. And people do that because they get trust, frustrated, they get scared, they have anxiety, and who do they lash out? The person that's closest to them, okay? So what you gotta do is you have to make sure that number one, you're hiring a professional photographer to take a picture of that property, that you're doing drone videos for that property that you're spending money on that property, that you're sitting open houses in that property, right? That, you're ha that you have good handouts and stuff like that. Here's an example. I mean, and this is, you know, this is kind of the standard. This is what we should be doing, you guys, when it comes to flyers, right? We wanna have professional pictures. We wanna have professional flyers. We wanna have good this, good that. We wanna be doing the open houses. We wanna be calling these clients at least once a week, no matter what. Call them every Monday. You just call all of your clients just to check in, even if nothing has happened, okay? And then that way, they know that you've done everything you possibly can except drop the price. Because what happens is clients um, call the agent and they go, well, my house, you know, nobody's shown my house. Nobody's done this, nobody's done that. Why aren't you marketing my house better? You know, why aren't you doing this? And then you go, well, you're overpriced. You know what I mean? And then they think, oh, you just want this thing to sell quick. You just want me to drop the price so you can get an easy commission. So I set the expectation during the listing appointment that, hey, this is what the competition is. I'm going to call you once a week. You know, we're going to go over any changes that have happened. You should be getting three showings a week. If you're not, then we're probably overpriced. And you get the feedback. The feedback will soften them. Okay, because people are going to come in and you got to give them the unvarnished, well, sometimes I varnish the feedback a little, but a lot of times you want to do unvarnished feedback. Here's my listing presentation. You guys can pass that around. Um, but I think if you do that and the, and the client is confident that you're doing everything and you're really working hard for them, which you should be then uh, I don't think you'll have that problem getting the price reductions because it's the natural thing. Because what you do basically is you eliminate any potential everything except the price. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So you limit, eliminate every potential roadblock to selling the house except the price so that the client doesn't think you're just getting a price reduction. Yes, ma'am. How often do you drop the price in which increments? Every 30 days. Just Days? Every 30 days. No, no. If it's not sold, 30 days. And sometimes more. Do you go by a certain percentage or how do you know? I usually like that? to look at what the uh, competition is and go below that. You know, make sure. So, like I said, I, I have a, a setup for every one of my listings so that I, I automatically get emails. And when something happens, I'm calling the client saying, oh, wow. And the clients are like, wow. You're really watching this, you know? It's like, and then you go in and just say, hey, you know, this guy's at uh, 255. Let's go at 254. You know? Because you want to be one step ahead of the rest of them. So it kind of depends on how that goes. And, you know, if we're way overpriced or something like that, then it, it just depends, you know? Let's say you've got a client that is super overpriced, they don't want to listen to any of your advice. Right, but they're on. They're at a house where you can, you know, where your sign is out front, and it gets you know four hundred thousand cars a week driving by the house. Right, or it's a great one for open houses because it's in one of those locations where you get thousands of people coming in. You do an open house on the weekend, you get thirty people in. If they don't want to listen. I mean, I've had agents that say, well, you know, they don't want to listen to me. I'm just going to cancel, forget the listing. They don't want to price it right and all that kind of stuff. You know what? Sometimes you get those, and if it's if it's a good platform for you to go get more business, leave it at the price. Don't fight with them. 
You know, you get that too. I'll get people that will just fight, fight, fight. And I and then so I'll look at the house and I'll think, okay, well, every weekend we sit here and we have an opportunity of 20 more people. This platform for us, it's a nice house. Eh, why fight them on it? Let the, let the market do it. You know, I, I generally I don't do that. But sometimes, if you get somebody like that, and otherwise it's a great platform for you to get more business, why not? Right? Don't fight them. Yes? Do you use offers from, as your listing presentation, offers from other uh, Some people do that. So, just to compare your service with yeah. their offers? Some people do that. Um, her question was the uh, instant offer companies that we're seeing pop up out there. They're about 8% of the market right now. They'll probably never be more than 10%. And as soon as the market takes a downturn, they're all going to be out of business. But in the meantime, um, they can be a good wedge for you because you can get an offer from them on one of the listings that you're getting ready to put on the market because they're all thinking about that anyways. So you can get one of those offers. You can bring it into them and you can show it to them. And then you can say, and by the way, on the back end, they're going to charge you 9 to 12% to sell the house. So you're going to wind up making this much. With me, you're going to wind up making this much. But what it does do is it gives them a market, kind of a market value. Um, the other thing, and that reminds me, I'm glad you brought that up, is before I go out on the listing appointment, I'm also going to go check Zillow and Realtor.com. Right? We know those are inaccurate, but who else is looking at those? Right. That's the sellers, man. They're going to be looking at that stuff. So you want to know what they're looking at, right? You want to know what that number is. And another thing that's important, too, is before you go out on that appointment, you got to kind of slide this one in a little bit because you don't want them to think that you got an ulterior motive. But you want to kind of know where their head is at on the house. And so you're going to say to them, at some point, you're going to slip it in there. You're going to say, so what do you think the house is worth? Right? You just kind of see what their what their number is so that you know what you're dealing with before you go out. Because, I mean, in this case, <clears throat> I, I told these people they should list a house somewhere between 735, 755. They were thinking like 800, you know, which was way out there. And then just before we went on the market, their neighbor, like I think I told you guys, maybe I didn't, went on for like $900,000. So she wanted to raise the house, the price. So we went way high, sat on the market, we went through five offers, because it's got solar. By the way, how much does solar add to the value of the property? It takes away, doesn't it? What's that? Doesn't it lose value because of solar? What's that, say it again? Isn't it a problem when it has solar? Oh yeah, it's a huge problem. Solar is always a huge problem. What, what do appraisers add for solar? Zero. That's right, zero. No, but if it's owned, then it has a big They still add zero. I talked no, to an appraiser. But, but the buyers appreciate if it's owned. If the it's buyers like if it's owned, owned, although I had a buyer that <laughs> said, well, wait a second. These are five-year-old yeah. owned solar panels. They're outdated. Yeah, I want money. That's what happened. Okay. Yeah. He thought that they were, he was like, well, these are outdated. They're owned, but they're outdated. So uh, solar panels add zero value and tons of problems. So, There's not enough education out there about them, so that's why it's a lot of ignorance, a lot of, um, yeah, we bought one with solar, we'll never do it again. Right. <laughs> People just don't know. The savings isn't really huge. So, um, at the best of circumstances, the savings might be 500 bucks a year or something like that, and then you got a thousand holes in your roof. So. Uh, if anybody asks me about solar, I mean, and I drive a Prius, okay, just so you guys full, you know, to be completely transparent. I am about being green and everything, but it's at the same time, you know, that solar stuff is just horrible right now. So it adds zero value. And so when you are going out to do a listing, people always assume, oh my God, this solar is going to add so much to my house. And you have to do it in a nice way because you don't want them to feel stupid for buying the solar panels, right? But you gotta, you're gonna have to say, well, you know, right now it's hard to really assess a value to those. So the appraisers, not you, make the appraiser. So the appraisers won't add any value for the solar panels and 
it can make the transaction more complicated when we get ready to close. Okay? So, that's that. But anyways, um, I'm pretty much done unless you guys got a point. Yes, yeah. go. So, you, you use the statistical market analysis to the, the arm list. Do you ever go through and use the full CMA where it allows for adjustments to properties in the context of, again, the original question, if you didn't have uh, matching with number of bedroom bathrooms, will you go on in and actually use those that option for no. adjusting the property? No, uh, I don't. And it, the reason is, um, and he's talking about, <coughs> excuse me, when you can go into Flex MLS, you can do this whole thing where you can go in and do pluses and minuses and all that kind of stuff. Right. I've never done that because I've always felt that um, what we need to do is get into close enough. You know, we got to get into the, you know, into the sweet zone without too much detail because we just don't know. The buyer, the seller, there's so many different things that go into it. You know, you subtract $1,000 for the fireplace and you add, you know, 5000 for the pool and all that kind of stuff. I've always felt that it just made the presentation a little too complicated and I like to streamline it and just give them this number, this number, and this number. I've just always, it's always worked better for me. Yes, ma'am. So when you pull up comps both ways. By the way, I love your gray hair. I just had to say that, okay, I love that. It took I think, me a long time to get it this I love time. that, no, my wife <laughs> let hers go gray. I think it's, I love it. It's I had pretty to color it once a week. <laughs> See, before. that's what she had to do too. Hair. So anyway. Yes. Thank you. Um, and I'm told it goes well with brown eyebrows and brown eyes. It does. Yours. It does. <laughs> yours. Thank okay. you. So, if I pull up two CMAs, one from Monsoon and one from MLS or RPR or whoever, and I get different properties, is there some way to put them into one piece that's emailed yes. out? Yes. Yes. If you are using RPR, which looks really slick and nice, you guys all know what RPR is? Okay. You can go in and you can pull, and I use RPR too, you can pull the comps from the MLS and then you can put the MLS numbers in RPR to add them to what RPR pulled up. Did you know that? I'm still, Okay. I'm, I'm like, you know, Yes. I'm still in first grade. No, that's okay. okay. That's all right. You're yeah. learning. That's I why am. you're here. That's right. That's okay. So when you go into RPR, you'll see that there's a section where you can add your own comparables. I've, I've seen that. Yes. I haven't quite gotten there yet. Yeah, and just do that. So what I do. That's second grade. Right. No, that's okay. A lot of times RPR puts way too much stuff in there. And it's like 80 pages and it's like, oh my God, you know, and then it just freaks the clients out. Now, when you're a newer agent, you think, yeah, you know, this is going to show that I've really kind of gone through and done this, but it puts a barrier. So there is one that's. Uh, <clears throat> I think it's a buyer comp, not the seller comp, but the buyer comp that's much shorter in RPR. It's like 10 pages. And I will use that one because it does look nice, looks really professional, and uh, I can you can put your own comps in there. And you can pull some of their comps, and then it pulls up the list, and you can pick which ones you want in there. Okay? So just go in there and check it out. Yes? And so when you're pulling up comps, I, I tried to do comps on this property in like kind of an older area of Phoenix. Okay. And you've got a, a, the price range is somewhere between a hundred thousand and two hundred and ten mm -hmm. for a very similarish square footage of properties. So when you're trying to look, do you have? Is there some way to go to look at how upgraded is it? without having to go back and, I mean, I end up using three devices at once to right. figure, oh, okay, so I'm, that's, I'm like. That's pretty normal to do that. I do the same thing. Okay. Yeah, you'll have to go through picture by picture by picture. You'll have to do aerial views. You might have to do a street view on Google Earth to look around and see what the neighboring properties look like. But yeah, <clears> I just thought that, uh, <laughs> I know, I, I wish you, it was easier. I thought your college professors knew better, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, I wish there was a magic bullet, but it's just, it's tough it sometimes. Seems like there, be a, there, should, there should be an easy way. Okay, you click here, and then there's the, and then you, and then you go back. And I try to go back, and then end up at the beginning again. It just, yeah. There should be a more nuts. scientific way that's. I know, well, and that's what, that's what the eye buyers are doing, like the open doors of the world and all that. 
they're trying to use algorithms and all that kind of stuff uh, and it just doesn't work it really just doesn't work I mean you actually have to get out there they're never going to replace realtors okay you're always going to need a realtor um, that, like I said they're going to take a small portion of the market and they use these algorithms to figure out what values are in the houses and all that but they're not making any money they haven't made any money since day one they're losing money yeah. those companies are but they got a lot of people behind them so it's always going to be us <clears throat> and the, and the only thing you can do is keep it simple like this look at the pictures do aerials and and use your common sense and you guys all have that you know we're not all spring chickens in this room so we've been around we all know you know kind of we have a feel for what values are and we kind of know what's going on and the more you work with buyers and sellers that'll even hone your skills that much more where you when you're out showing buyers all these properties all around the valley like we do we do my team we probably do on average about five deals a week and so we're out there you know and we see what people are willing to pay for things so that's kind of how it works but yeah go through that that RPR you can add stuff to it okay yeah I hope this has been helpful. Yes, yes. it's very helpful. Okay. Yeah. If you guys have any other questions, you have my card. If you have a tough one that comes up, feel free to reach out, send me an email with the address, and I'll I'll give you my advice on what price should be. I'll give you a range. Perfect. Okay? Thank you. Yes, sir. I do have a question not related to the uh, CMA analysis, but all of these low cost brokerages. How do you find out what really the cost is for Ultimdor and Homey and all of these companies that are going to charge you one percent or half percent? How do you ever understand what they're really charging? You don't. Well, what they do is like, oh, thank you, ma'am. Um, open door and all those kind of stuff. What they do is they charge you on the tail end. But somebody knows it. I mean, somebody like you, right? Who knows what this is? How do they do that? How do I find that out? Okay, some variables. All right, so big variables from home to home. Yeah. It does. Well, what they're doing is they're losing money hand over fist. I understand it. Right. So they're losing money. That's the that's the, the start of it. They're going to try and blow it up so they can sell it. I did consulting with Open Door for a year when they first opened out here. They hired me to come in and do some stuff. So I kind of know what they're doing. As far as they're just not making money. Period. Is there a, is there a, is there a standard cost that you say you want to buy one percent but you're going to hit with a 12% transaction. Okay, yes. That's what I'm trying to get. Yeah, what I would just tell you is I would say, first of all, uh, Open Door and those guys are different. They just buy and sell houses. Hopey, I think, lists the house. They're a discounter, like a 1%, I think is what you were saying. Yeah, but still, they have when they list it on the it's going to be a 2.5% or 3% selling it. I think what they, well, they'll tell you 1%. But that's 1% for them. Yeah, that's the list. Right, it's usually 4%. Yeah. So, yeah, because they still have to pay the other side. So they go, well, they don't tell you that. That's all you got to tell them. Before. They, before what, what I would do, I go, well, did they tell you that you still have to pay a buying agent if a buying agent comes in? Yeah. Oh, no, they didn't tell me that. Well, yeah, that's 3%. Now, uh, these homes, that, these these companies just buy the house outright, like Zillow now buys houses. Uh, they lost 76 million last quarter. Oh, good. Before that. Good. I'm happy to hear that. And that's in an up market. So, uh, those companies charge, that where they make the money is on the tail end. It's hidden. So, what they'll do is they'll, they'll go in and they'll offer you a market value for your property. But the reason they do that, not because they're nice guys, it's because they're going to turn around and sell that property again. So, they don't want the comps to be low. So, so they give you a market value, but then they charge you nine percent when you close for a resale fee, nine to twelve. Got it. Cool. Yeah, yeah it's 